Good day and welcome to this week's episode of Strictly Legal on WESN Content Capital. I am your host, Rondell Dono, attorney at law, and once again, I'm happy to bring the law and you. Of course, you can stream us on WESN CC on all social media platforms, including streaming on the World Wide Web. Um, now, today, of course, um, of course, we are thinking outside the box in terms of Strictly Legal. And we are speaking about the concept of therapeutic jurisprudence. Now, you would ask, what is therapeutic jurisprudence? Whether it is practiced in Trinidad, what is the concept? How can it reform the, the accused and the persons that are involved in, in, in criminal activities or those who are accused of such crimes? Now, I have a very, very um, learned person um, in that particular field, uh, Mr. Hanif E. A. Benjamin, as he is called. Um, he's a clinical psychologist and clinical Traumatologist. Um, just a bit about Mr. Benjamin. Um, again, as I said, he's a clinical therapist and traumatologist. Um, he holds a clinical master's of social work with distinction in New York City, receiving uh, a bachelor's of science in criminal justice. He also has a certification in criminal traumatology from the Traumatology Institute of Canada and a certification in children's trauma. Now, Mr. Benjamin is currently a uh, a PhD student, well, a PhD uh, uh, student basically at the University of the West Indies and is a senior adjunct lecturer and tutor in the Department of Behavioral Science at COSTAT and the University of the Southern Caribbean, including uh, UE. Uh, he is a licensed master of, um, he's a licensed social worker both in Trinidad and Tobago and in America. He was also the chairman of the uh, Children's Authority and of course he has or he owns his own practice. Um, and of course, he would uh, tell you all more about his, his, his practice that he is involved in, um, in terms of what they do, and it's called the TCHD Postgraduate Training Institute. Uh, so, Mr. Benjamin, I know it's a lot that I would have stated about him, but I have to, basically. So, Mr. Benjamin, good morning. Good morning, Arundel. Thank you for having me on Strictly Legal. It is indeed my pleasure. And thank you for joining the set. Of course, as a non-attorney, I know a lot of people are <laughs> um, wondering why I do have a non-attorney on board. But of course, the law evolves and it transcends attorneys because mm -hmm. we have also other practice areas that forms part of the legal jurisprudence. Indeed. And, and, and interestingly enough, you would notice my bachelor's is criminal justice and my master's is a clinical master's of social work. And what I have recognized is the synergistic approach between the law and social work or the law and society. And one cannot practice one without the other. And so it is so interesting at the conversation this morning being therapeutic jurisprudence. It is indeed a mixing of the two. And, and I mean, I, I know when I would have advertised this program, uh, many of my colleagues mm -hmm. were like, what is therapeutic jurisprudence? So let's start with the, with the, with the layman's definition of, of, of what is therapeutic jurisprudence. So, so, so Rundle therapeutic jurisprudence is a study of the role of law as a therapeutic agent. And not to be mistaken with you providing therapy in lieu of law or that therapy trumps law. So basically, therapeutic jurisprudence is a perspective that regards the law as a social force that produces behavior and consequences. Right, and, and, and what, and, and just explain in terms of the, is it, is it psychology basically mm -hmm. trying to get into the minds of the, of the accused person? Does it have to be reforming of the, the accused person? What, what exactly, well, um, who are the target um, individuals? Well, the, the system, the system is the target. You, you see, one has to understand when you practice law, the actors of law, whether it is the, the judge, uh, the, the prosecutor, the defense, whether it is civil, non, whatever it is, they are all players in the legal fraternity. The question is, what is the outcome of a system? And that is what we want to inculcate here. When somebody is accused, when somebody is charged, when somebody comes before the court, for example, and there is a guilty verdict or there is a pronouncement of a fine or something, what happens then? We want this person to be able to come back to society or to engage in society in a way that is helpful and not hurting. 
We know, Rondell, that a lot of people don't like to engage in the law because they think it is brutal, it is cutthroat, it cuts you down. Therapeutic jurisprudence creates a bridge where you understand the reasons, where you go a step further, where you look at things from a different perspective so that you can help people to understand. Even, and, and, and I made this point yeah. earlier, we are practicing it here, our children's court. But let's, let's be, before we get to the children's court, mm -hmm. let's start with the history. Where, where, where did this, um, this, this, this concept coin, where was it coined? So David, where was it David Wexler, um, decided to look at this when he was examining the Mental Health Act then in America. So it's, it's an American um, Correct. principle. Yes, it's mm. American principle. And, and what David did uh, as a professor, what he did is he examined why is it people who are living with mental health and they came before the court, they were treated in such a disparaging manner. They were not seen as equal to other defendants. Right, and so what it did, uh, you would know the, um, the, the insanity plea, yes. right? And they made insanity plea a bad thing in so much as clients prefer to go to jail than to plead um, reason of insanity as a defense. Because when you look at it, 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 they lock you up in an asylum forever or they put you in a mental institution for an indefinite period until such time. Those are the kind of words that were being used. Yes. And so what therapeutic jurisprudence did and what David Wexler did in his research is saying, listen, let us create a system where we can understand the person, understand when a person is saying uh, a, an insanity plea or something like that. What does it mean for that person? What does it mean for rehabilitation? But, 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 then, but then we can see here that we have social workers or we have therapists well, I, I assume Correct. Um, that would um, do a psychiatric evaluation mm -hmm. uh, because of especially when when an accused is brought before the magistrate's court, uh, the first thing if they're saying that they are um, insane, um, the court would send them for psychiatric evaluation. Mm -hmm. But is that enough? It's not. It's not. Th that is where it begins and ends. We send you for a psychiatric ev evaluation. What is the therapeutic jurisprudence part of this? Where does the law meets mental health? Where does the law meet rehabilitation? And that is the crux of therapeutic jurisprudence. We are bringing the two together where a client, a person who comes before the court, even in sentence, can feel assured that they were heard, they were understood, they understand the sanctions, they know where and what to do, and it also includes Rondell beyond that. What happens with rehabilitation? Because we keep forgetting the key factor here. Unless you are going away for life without the possibility of parole, you are coming back to this society. Check the recidivism rate. Check how many times, even from an adolescent perspective, you go in and out, in and out, until you get to big jail. What therapeutic jurisprudence does, mm -hmm. it sets up a system where we get you to a place, even from the time you are charged, to when you are sentenced, so when you are released, so that you can bring back value, you can add value to your society. And Hanif, I think, I think we, we, we want to take it step by step, and mm. I think after the break, we will start with, with who are the professionals that, that, are, that are qualified uh, to handle this type of, um, this type of work. Uh, you are watching Strictly Legal, we'll be right back. Stay tuned. And we're back speaking about uh, the concept of therapeutic jurisprudence with my guest, Hanif E. E. Benjamin. Uh, so Hanif, before the break, you were speaking about uh, that therapeutic jurisprudence uh, transcends, that it starts from, from arrest, uh, the, the trial, sentencing, and of course, um, thereafter. Now mm -hmm. tell us, who are the qualifying figures? How do you qualify yourself uh, to form part of, of this type of, um, of, of discipline? The beauty about TJ, as it is known, therapeutic jurisprudence, is that all of us are actors in this field. You, a practicing attorney, the judge, the magistrate, the police, the, the, the prison officer, the, the, the commissioner of prisons, everybody, is part of this continuum. So, it, it, so it's the change, really. 
is a change in our mindset as to how we deal with this. You know why is that rundown? Because we, we, we no longer, or we have never really paid attention to the end result. What is the end? We send in somebody and that's it. It, it. it ended at my juncture here, and it's now somebody else's problem. But when you really look at TJ, it tells us that it's a continuum. Because if it, it can't just end here, and then it's somebody else, because that somebody else ends up back in society. So everybody becomes a player in therapeutic jurisprudence. Everybody now sees um, their, their role. Everybody interacts with the client. Everybody interacts with the system from a therapeutic place. But, but, but. Isn't there need for some sort of training in this regard? Definitely. Because we've seen where Definitely. judicial officers aren't really trained to deal with the psychological um, aspect of, of, of someone who comes before the court, litigants. So, so I understand that in Trinidad we don't, I mean, yes, it is practiced somewhat um, indirectly, mm -hmm. but how do we bring that type of jurisprudence in our jurisdiction and, 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 and how, can we, um, how can it be flourished? Let us start with legislation. Yes. I believe that it is time for our Mental Health Act to be revised badly. I, I honestly don't think that it, 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 still, it, it captures anything of today's. For example, suicidality is and it, still- And it's very archaic, actually. Oh, it's mm. beyond archaic. Is there a word beyond archaic? <laughs> right? You could probably school me on that. Middle but it's far, far, mm. far, far, far. Mm. Rondell, suicidality is still a crime. In 2021, that suicide is linked to mental health, but yet it is a crime. Changing the law, re-examining the Mental Health Act is therapeutic jurisprudence. The way police interact with people who are living with mental illness. In the last 10 years, how many persons living with mental illness on a police call was killed or harmed? because we don't know how to handle them, because they are not trained in dealing with somebody who's living with bipolar. Particularly in this pandemic? Correct. Mm -hmm. And even more so in this pandemic, when a person who commits a crime and they steal something from somebody's home, yes, they lock up and we throw them away for six months, but the concept of why did this person feel the need to go to steal bread and milk has to be considered. And it must now be did this person steal because of something larger? So therefore, are we saying that when an offence is committed, because at the end of the day, theft is a criminal offence, are we saying that now when they come before the court, there need to be an assessment? You know, like for instance, when you're dealing with custody matters, um, the, court would, um, the court will institute a, a social, uh, a, a social work, work report. Mm -hmm. Is it that you are saying that before sentencing, that the court should should have a report done in terms of why this person did Definitely, this. Rondell, therapeutic jurisprudence. You know what that does? It tells us whether this person needs to go to a rehab, whether this person needs to be on parole or probation, and whether or not we are clogging our, um, our prison system with people who should not be there because we did not take into account the challenges that brought them before the court. Because at the end of the day, there, there are different types of consequences. Of it does course. not necessarily have to be sentencing. Of course. And this is why, this is what we stress on, sentencing. That is meaning, meaning custodial sentencing rather than re restorative Co justice. Ah. I, I love how it is coming to life because that is what therapeutic jurisprudence does. It allows us to examine case by case why. We have to ask ourselves why. Because if we don't ask ourselves why, Rondell, that same person who is before you will come for six months, come out for two days, go back in for six months. And we're seeing it regularly. I mean, you in the court, you yes. see mm -hmm. what goes on in the magisterial um, sector. It's, it's a revolving door. Because we are not asking the question, somebody who is on crack cocaine or some type of drug or substance, is it solving any purpose, financial or otherwise, for them to be in and out of prison. You know how much money it is to house a person in prison for one day, rather than from a therapeutic perspective, examining why is this person here? What can we do? And what that did as well from David Wexler and his study is created specialized courts. And we see that has been happening in the last 10 years or so. Yeah, we've seen drug treatment Correct. courts, et cetera, as pilot projects. What, what Correct. And that is what but, I'm saying. We are doing it to some extent without knowing what it is. But the challenge is it should not be siloed 
It mm. should be around the, the table and everybody should be part of it. So you need to understand what is drug treatment, even divorce uh, or domestic violence. I tell people that yes. domestic violence is not just lock up the man and throw him in jail. Yes. What about maintenance? It's not just lock up the man, throw him away. What is the therapeutic jurisprudence perspective here in taking a man from the home or taking a man from the child's life to put him in jail where he can't earn to pay something that he could not earn to pay or he failed to pay? Mm. We must find a different way. And what therapeutic jurisprudence does, it brings all the players together to say, how can we heal a system? No, Rundle, I don't want us because I know people right now saying, but this man trying to propose a softer approach. Yeah. And it's not a matter of, 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 of the softer approach or trying to put a slap on your wrist. But, in it, but it is important that when you complete your sentence, you can go back into society and not repeat the same thing again. And uh, Rundle, I wanted to, to put a pin there. When you say sentence, it doesn't mean jail, jail sentence. Yes, yes. It means Uncle Monitor. I know the Attorney General is, is getting there. Or is and actually it, has, there yeah, already. it was already there. And so yes, therapeutic jurisprudence works perfectly with that. We're talking about probation or parole. Perfect with that. I know we are getting into the parole soon. Therapeutic jurisprudence work with that. Because not everybody deserves to go behind bars. And this is where therapeutic jurisprudence comes in. So yes, training and development is critical to understand it's a paradigm. It's a paradigm shift in the mind. Indeed. It is what we think about. It yes. is how we see, how we interact with the law and human. Now, now tell me, I mean, I, let's, let's do a live working example. You have been chairman of Children's Authority Correct. Uh, in the past for, for three years approximately. Correct. Now, tell us how... Does, in, in, terms of, in terms of your role or your experience, how has this concept incorporated in what you would have done or what you would have tried to do in terms of the reform of, of the Children's Authority? Because children, I mean, I, I mean they, they are adolescents. They are the mm. ones that are needed. They are the ones that need, their minds need to be reformed in order so that they don't follow what they see. Right, and so the beauty about therapeutic jurisprudence and where I sat as chairman is understanding, again, the key players. You see, we had what was critical for me, and that is why I set up a committee, a stakeholder committee, immediately, because you had to get to the key players. The children court is a critical factor. Right? Uh, the police is a critical factor, the way we treat children, even when you rewrote the judge's rule in relation to children. That is therapeutic jurisprudence. How you engage, that is therapeutic jurisprudence. Because you cannot just tackle everybody from a criminal perspective. We have to understand why mom, why dad did what they did. Why are they continuing to do what they do? So you had to shift the focus from a punitive, you need to do this or else, to, uh, let me hear what's going on so I can support you. Let me see how the children's court can support. Let me see how the police, let me see how national family services, let me see how the Ministry of Social Development can support. When we bring these people synergistically together, that is therapeutic jurisprudence because at the end of the day, the client, the client, which is the child or the parent or the family, will not just have a, a, a day in court, or, but they will have something to say, you know what? I could see tomorrow. I understand the challenges and I understand how we could move forward. And as a system, Rondell, as a system, we could then say we help this client move from point A to point B in a positive manner. Indeed. And if we will take a, a quick break and we'll be right back. You're watching Strictly Legal, the concept of therapeutic jurisprudence. And we're back with Hanif Benjamin on WESN Content Capital Strictly Legal. Now, before the break, Hanif, we were speaking about the role of different parties that involves in therapeutic jurisprudence and how well, and I mean, in terms of the engagement of stakeholders and the laws that, are, that, that, that have been passed. But I want to deal with a sensitive topic, which is, and you're seeing a lot of, um, a lot of instances of sexual assault, sexual mm. offenses, um, whether it's within the family, whether it's within the community. And it's, 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 it's a lot. Now tell me, I mean, there's a lot of theories as to why this is happening, but why is it that persons who are, are arrested for sexual offenses, they do their time, they come back out, they do it again and again and again, and the cycle keeps repeating without the victim 
because the victim is important, both victim and perpetrator being reformed. Our society is a punitive one. We have always been. And when you look at the silos again, we see where, okay, I did my part, and we put them in jail, or they get sentenced, whatever, and then that's it. And I keep making the point, until and unless we begin to tackle this from a therapeutic jurisprudence perspective, they will continue to do what they do. What goes on in that prison? What level of intervention is required to help that person when they come out to not reoffend. What is interesting about the point you just made about the amount of people going before the court is the amount of times that they were before the court prior to that for the same offenses. Now, one of the ways in Trinidad we tend to tackle things, unfortunately, is legislation. And I keep making the point, and I, and I did make this point to the Goodly Attorney General at one point, we cannot legislate emotion. We cannot legislate emotion. Because we are a reactive society. Correct, yeah? correct. And therefore, if we want to see a change, if we want to break that cycle, we need to do two things. We need to treat with the perpetrator, and we also need to treat with the victim. The victim sometimes is left undone. After the case, or even during the case, there is no more counseling, there is no more professional help. And therefore, the victim continues to live with that pain and hurt. The perpetrator goes to prison, right? And that person just there, you spend 10, 15, 20 years, and then you're back out, or six months, 10 months, whatever. But did that person change sufficiently to bring about a change? So they move on to a different victim. Yeah. In other jurisdictions, what happened, there's a dedicated program in prison, right? I worked in the Westchester Mental Health Unit uh, in New York City. And we had so many different programs in prison. And one was for sexual offenders. Because it is understood, Rondell, yes. that this is partly mental health challenges as well. Is it that we don't have enough mental health professionals in Trinidad and Tobago? I mean, I know a lot of people do psychology, we social have work. We enough. But... You see, now we need an hour here. <laughs> we have enough clinicians, whether it is a psychologist, a social worker, we have enough clinicians to do the work that is required. What we don't have in this country is a recognition that the social ills are keeping us apart. The social ills are great and we keep making that mistake. Crime is a social problem. Rape and the sexual assault are social problems, but we don't treat it like that. And therefore, we have the continuation or the cycle of these crimes consistently because we are not treating with the course. Dr. Diane Williams, a criminologist um, who retired from UE, she said it best. She said, if we are not dealing with the social ills of society, we will forever have overrun prisons. We will forever have overrun magisterial courts. We will forever have situations in our high court because we are not dealing with the why. And even when the person gets to prison, that person is coming back to society. Well, therefore, that means that, that, the, that the, 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 the ministries or the departments that are in charge of dealing with the why, are they funded enough or are they staffed enough to deal with the social ills? Because, I, think the I mean, it boils down to, yes, government plays, plays a part in the pillars, the church, well, all, all sectors, the family. I think people just don't understand the why. Or, or, or because we are such a punitive society, we negate the why. We don't want to ask the why. All we want to do is lock you up and throw the key, right? That is all we want to do, but we're not seeing beyond locking you up and throw the key. But, but then there's another argument that we have reached the stage where crime is such, crime has, has, has gone, has, has been a runaway horse. So therefore persons don't care about the why anymore. We will all continue. they want is justice. We want justice. What is justice? I think people have a false sense of justice as well. Because justice is not just lock up and throw away the key. Justice is rehabilitation. Justice is restitution. Justice is therapeutic. Justice is about equity, is about putting people back at a place. But we, don't, we, we, we see justice in segregated portions. 
and everybody looking at their own in their own corner. But if we really want a society where people feel less fed up and we have people less running around terrorizing people, we need to look at the social ills. We need to ask the question, why? And therapeutic jurisprudence help us to ask the question, why? Why is it a man will not pay child support? Why is it a man will not, uh, hmm. uh, you know, these are questions you need to ask. Or rather, why is it that when men try to and not go to go there. <laughs> try to try to help their children, try to be there for their children, want to be there for their children, they are being resisted. They are, I have somebody right examples. now, a friend of mine just yesterday called me in distress about it. <laughs> Myself too, I'm dealing with an injunction. I mean, of course this is um, privilege, but yes. And, 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 and the issue here is, well, you're getting a child because you didn't do this, but when I try to do it, so what happens there? You understand, even domestic violence, and people don't like me to say this, but I always tell my goodly friend, Guy Allen, we have to deal with the better truth. Mm, domestic yes. violence is not always the man hit she. But you have to ask a question, what surrounded this circumstance to cause this level of behavior? Therapeutic jurisprudence. Yes. It is not just lock up the man and put him in jail. You have to understand the continuum as to why we got to where we are. And if you don't understand that it's a cyclical disease that is going to continue to permeate itself in Trinidad and Tobago. And this, this, this definitely is a series. And if this, I mean, uh, just before we end, I mean, Sher Shelly Ann Williams, I believe that's a colleague, she said special shout out to US Keynes online. Whatever okay, that is. Okay. And of course, uh, Michelle Emanuel also indicated that, you know, very well said, no locking up and training away the key. So people are understanding the concept and people are understanding why is it that we need the why? Why is it that we need more looking at restorat restorative justice Correct. rather than just locking mm -hmm. up and there's no reform? You go back into society, you do the same thing over and over. Can't help her. Can't happen. And if we keep doing that, Rondell, we will forever be in this place where people are scared, people are fed up, people don't know what to do. If we want to fix Trinidad and Tobago, we have to change our thinking, our ideologies, our principles. We have to look at the bigger picture, and the bigger picture is a better Trinidad and Tobago. And if I, I believe that, that I will need to have you back because this is, this is a conversation that we need to have on strict legal, not just talking about the law, but putting it into practice and putting real life situations Correct. because it is something that is constantly taking place, constantly being a, a, on, on the tip of the tongue of persons, people having seminars, discussions, and we are just going around in circles, um, Hanif. You know, we just go around in circles. But, but your closing comments. Listen, always the Center for Human Development Limited is always willing and ready to partner, to teach, to guide. That is what we do. We are about developing humans, developing a better Trinidad and Tobago. And this is one such concept where all of us, all the profession, can sit around the table to develop a better Trinidad and Tobago. So embrace the concept. Think about the therapeutic jurisprudence. I think it's the way to go. Indeed. Thank you so much, very much. Pleasure. And um, it's a pleasure having you here, and we will see you again soon. Thank you. So, guys, you have been looking at Strictly Legal on WESN Content Capital, the concept of therapeutic jurisprudence. There's a lot of work to be done, a lot of things to speak about. I thank my guest, Mr. Benjamin. See you next time. Take care.